You're listening to Legally Bliss Conversations. This podcast reclaims and rewrites the stories female attorneys have been told about how we should practice law, grow our businesses, treat our clients, treat ourselves, and craft our identities as female attorneys. We'll hear inspiring stories from current and former female attorneys, the ones who question the stories they've been told, the ones who aren't afraid to live boldly and step into their own power. We'll learn from women who define success on their terms. Through lighthearted and curious conversation, we'll unpack the challenges these inspiring female attorneys have already navigated. So join me on this journey. You'll be empowered and ready to rewrite a completely new story about what is possible for you. I would love to welcome Haley Lavishiavili. So initially interested in entertainment law, she spent her summer after one out at Warner Brothers, returning to LA where she spent her undergraduate studies as a presidential scholar at USC. She then went on to work at Christie's auction house during her 2L fall semester, ultimately deciding she wanted to explore more facets of the legal industry to truly understand the industry she wanted to be in. She came across the idea to offer her services to multiple lawyers for a monthly retainer fee and never looked back. So now Haley dedicates herself to helping law students and lawyers connect to complete project-based work, just as she did beginning her 2L spring semester. So welcome, Haley. I am so happy you're here. Thank you so much for having me. I've been so excited to come to this podcast in particular. And, you know, through everything that we went through, it makes it that much more special to be here right now and to be chatting with you. So thank you again for having me. Yeah, it's fun. So I have to ask you, what is your last <laughs> name? Like, tell me, like, what, what is the, where does this originate? Livia Shavili. So it's from Georgia, this is the former Soviet Union. That's where my dad's from. My mom's Not from America. America. Not in America. <laughs> no, a lot of Georgia. Know, they think Georgia. Oh, that doesn't make sense. But yeah, so Ashvili in Georgian means child of. So it's child mm-hmm. of Levy. And so that's where if you ever meet someone from Georgia, they're likely going to have an Ashvili at the end of their last name. So that's oh, where wow. it comes from. My dad came here when he was in high school. So around that time, but he went from Georgia to Belgium to Israel and then finally wow. made it to the U.S. So he's he's a well-traveled man and he's very well well spoken. He had he knows like four or five different languages. Yeah, nice. I don't unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, yes, that's where it comes from. Okay, he sounds like a really interesting person. Is he someone that <laughs> yes. has inspired you? Oh, absolutely. Both of my parents really have. My mom's a very strong woman. So she's helped like instill very strong features in me. And my dad, he actually has worked in corporate his whole life. So he was at American Express and at Goldman Sachs. And now he's at Fitzgerald and he is the hardest working working human being I know and that and I'm and that instilled a work ethic in me but I saw that working in a corporate environment there wasn't as much room for autonomy and growth or like he actually grew a lot but um just personal growth I see I saw what corporate can do to you and like there were so many vacations where he was on the phone and like you know he worked such long hours just to provide for us and well I appreciate it so much but I was just like oh my gosh I can work 80 hours a week or 90 hours a week but I want to do it for myself and I don't want to have to answer to someone and be and constantly have to be at their their will so that really inspired me and it's funny because he went on such a, a very traditional corporate path, but he's yeah. encoding, so it's not law or anything. Yeah. <laughs> but he and my mom were both like, go to corporate law, do big mm-hmm. law, like they, like they were so adamant about it. And when I went on this extremely untraditional legal path, they both were like, what are you doing? You're turning down a firm offer to go on. What is, what are you talking? Like, they just thought I was nuts. And that really motivated me to be like, I'm going to prove you wrong. Like, I'm going to do it. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened. And it's been close to two years now. And they're finally like, wow, okay, she proved us wrong. So it's good. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. I love that you had that, uh, that little bit of motivation to prove them wrong. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that at all to kind of have yeah. like the, you know, the fire to get you oh, yeah. moving on it. So, yeah. okay, so why did you decide to go to law school? So I always, I love learning. I love learning about processes and, uh, and like just the way that our systems work. And it's just like kind of the foundation of our country. And like, I wanted to understand 
how we got to where we are and as a country, as an individual, like women's rights, everything. And so when I was an undergrad, I took a lot of pre-law classes and I just, I was like, I want to go to law school. And then I had this whole vision of being in entertainment because at USC, being in LA, I was surrounded by entertainment. So I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer that specifically worked on like human rights documentaries. Like I just had this whole pipe dream because, you know, being young and naive, you really think like you can make up anything you want and just go for it. And you can, but I think when I went to law school, Fordham is an incredible law school in, in New York City. And, but they really try and send as many people to corporate law as possible, which I think a lot of schools do. You know, it's a higher rankings, higher, higher salary, everything. And when I went to my career center, they sent, I told them about this dream and I think they were like, okay, but uh, there's a specific path when you go to law school, you know, like you do the, the summer judi the, the judicial clerkship, then you go to the big firm at, after your 2L year. So they had that process. They had a formula that really worked and they were like, do that, work at big law for five years, and then you're going to be able to do whatever you want which is valid. It's very true. If you had but, other ideas. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to wait till I was in, I didn't want to wait five years to do what I wanted to do. So as a first year, I, so I went to law school and as a first year, I was just like, okay, I guess I'll figure this out on my own. And then I started emailing whichever, any entertainment attorney that was willing to speak to me and just give me advice on how they got to where they are. I love and it. So, yeah. So it was a lot of hustling and a lot of like, lawyer's time is there it's really valuable and so the fact that people re actually respond and we're like yeah of course like let's hop on a call for 15 minutes like look looking back now I'm like wow that was really nice of them but um yeah there was one attorney that I connected with and she was at Warner Brothers and she's like hey like I really like talking to you do you want to come in for an interview we can see what happens and so then one thing led to another and I was able to land that internship after my first year no it was amazing it was such an incredible experience and then i was still you know you figure out your second year uh position during your first summer i feel like so i was just emailing a lot of entertainment firms because i was loving it i really thought it was a really cool space so i was like okay i'll go to a law firm after my second summer just to see what it's like to be in a, at an entertainment firm. And then I landed that position over my first year of summer. So I had my second summer set. And then when I went to Christie's, I was like, okay, there are so many different facets of the law. Like I did love entertainment, but it's uh, what if I like something more? And so then I took the networking skills that I gained in my first year and just being okay with sending a thousand emails and getting like three responses. And I just started networking like crazy with, any attorney that was willing to speak to me. And then in March, 2019 was when someone responded and they were like, uh, they were a cryptocurrency attorney back then. And whew, I should have uh, bought Bitcoin when it was at $800, <laughs> but didn't have the money. Then, think about that, right? <laughs> exactly. But um, he was general, but had a focus on crypto. And he was like, look, I need some projects done. I don't, I can't bring someone on full time. Would you want to help me with just like researching? Like he was actually having me build a like statutory guidebook for each state on what their status was with laws pertaining to crypto and so i was like absolutely like this is such cool experience for me like i can earn money while also just learning on a project basis so i kind of took that concept and ran with it and was just like let me get more attorneys let me earn more money let me start paying off my student loans and so it really just kind of it like it snowballed into what it is today and i didn't think that 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 i'd end up where I am today I really thought I was going to go on the firm route like the entertainment firm route but while I was at that entertainment firm my second year I actually um, was also working with the clients and I was like I love the multi the multitasking the multifaceted like I'm one day I'm working on a bankruptcy motion the next day I'm working on an estate plan the next hour I'm working on like drafting a contract so I really loved that like being able to dip my toes in everything and then when I had a lot of friends and other interns at the firm being like, this is so cool. Like, can I, can I get some work? That's when I realized like, okay, I'm not alone in this. And there are also a lot of smaller firms out there who could use the assistance. So I kind of discovered this gap in the legal education system and also the small firm of like the attorney world that 
I definitely would not have recognized if I didn't go to law school. So that's the the summary of how it all went down. Okay. So how long has gig law been around? What year did you officially start? So I officially started bringing on law students and like expanding the clientele in May of 2020, right when I graduated law school. So it's been exactly two years, I don't know, to the date, but um, I officially like created the LLC in June, but uh, yeah, so two years now. Okay, that's, that's incredible. So let me ask you about, like, do you service, okay, so who, how does the business model work? Mm-hmm. Does the firm pay you, I, I, I suppose? Yep. Okay, exactly. Because, I mean, law students are, you know, like. <laughs> Some of us were poor back then, so. <laughs> exactly. Oh, very. I was like, oh my God. I was like, like, yeah. Ramen noodles, right? Where it was like. Yep. Okay. Cereal, for bre- yeah. cereal for dinner, <laughs> multiple nights of the week. So, yeah, my diet in, high, in uh, law school did not contribute to my ability to think for sure. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, so, okay. So the business model basically is that the law firms pay you. Yep. Uh, kind of yep. like a, do they retain you or is it on a, mm-hmm. like a project by project basis? And so we used to, like when I first started out, it was a monthly subscription and that was very easy for me to do when I was like the most hands-on, they were directly dealing with me. But now over the last, I, I, about eight months ago, I would say I took everything I learned from the first year and built out all these processes and sent it to developers to build out an internal platform for our our clients to use and our students to use. So because now there's a platform where law students, I mean, law firms can upload the assignments and law students accept it without me having to physically be the middle middle person. um, Now we've switched to a project-based model where the law firms can submit whatever they want. We just track the hours and it's based on like an hourly rate model. But we do have some clients who can be part of the monthly subscription and then they just can, they submit like eight assignments per month or if they're on the unlimited plan they could just submit as many as they want so there's different options it's flexible so genius okay so is there a practice area that you found that seems to work really really well with this model oh absolutely actually you know it's funny because in the beginning, it was really focused on general business attorneys because that's what a lot of law students are interested in. You do have yeah. some that are interested in litigation and whatnot, but so general business law, that's a huge bucket. And then we actually do have a lot of litigators submitting assignments like, hey, I need this research or I need this motion drafted. And sure. like, so that actually turned into a big bucket. And then we also have a lot of um, personal injury lawyers and then other types of lawyers who need us to write blog posts for their website. So that's another bucket. But the most surprising bucket of attorneys that this model works so well with is estate planning attorneys. So I was like, I had no idea really what estate planning was. Like my parents had their estate plan in place and that was my only like visibility into that practice. But it really works well because we handle all the drafting. We're learning as we're going, all the students. And we also have paralegals on board who help with the drafting. And so it's a great model because a lot of estate plans or a lot of estate planning attorneys, like they have their legal assistants, they have their paralegals. Yeah. But I don't know if it's because of the pandemic, but so many people are just putting together estate plans now. So yeah. a lot of these firms are overwhelmed and they're like, we need someone to just bang out the drafting. It takes like two, three hours or something like that they don't have. And then yeah. they handle all the client communications and of course guiding the client. So that's a big bucket that was unexpected. Yeah, I think probably in 2020, a lot of people were thinking about. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Same planning. Okay, so I bet like, this is really cool. I bet one of the reasons you're you're really loving this is because you're obviously like an avid learner, like you love learning. So you're getting the opportunity, yeah, to like learn all of these different practice areas, right? You didn't have to select entertainment law, right? And kind of, and and, you know, here's the thing, like a lot of times, you know, being an attorney, like you don't branch out throughout your career. You you get even narrower in focus at your, right as you go along. So um, this seems like it's right out, like right up your, right up your alley. Exactly. No, I am so the type of person where it's not that like I get bored of it or anything, but I just constantly love learning. And I think it's just so cool to be able to see all these different types of projects. And even when I take on like a research assignment, like I'm learning something brand new, I had no idea about 
And it's cool because we have clients all across the US. So we have California, New York, but then also Wyoming, Nebraska, Texas, like Hawaii, the Hawaiian clients, like my favorite, because it's just so cool imagining their lives over there. But um, besides that, it's just, it's so interesting and it's just, there's so much, there's always something new to learn. And I think that's crucial for personal development and growth. And I think just understanding, as I mentioned, like that's why I went to law school. I just wanted to understand how everything works. And now I get to understand so many different elements. And the coolest part is, is that I really get to connect with so many different types of attorneys and attorneys generally have, I don't want to say a bad reputation, but there's a, you know, there's a stigma you know, around it. You know but <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, I've connected with so many amazing ones and like so many that just care. So they have so much passion for helping their clients. And like, that's really what practicing law and the legal profession should be. So to be able to like witness that and be a part of it and also see like these future attorneys with yeah. such, um, they're so eager and excited. And like, it's just, there's so much learning and like, even like how in, managing different personalities and then like dealing like giving feedback there's just been so much learning through it all so it's been great yeah so you're like so you kind of found this niche right like there's probably not like you said you found this little gap so yeah sort of creating and molding this as you go along yeah exactly and you're wearing a lot of different hats right now um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure as your company grows like you'll start you know right. help finding other people and you'll keep yes. like certain hats on like for yourself like the aspect exactly you love and they you know, like are in your zone of genius so mm -hmm. what like currently what is that to you like what do you love the most about it like which honestly hat is, like which hat development I love the most? or yeah or like actually working in the business I love, I truly love the development aspect of it, like growing the business, having the sales calls, just hopping on a call with, you know, I think it's not an easy sale whatsoever, but it's like when you speak to a lawyer who has some interest and you're telling them what we can do for them, they're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need. Like, why, why is, why hasn't this been created before? Yeah. <laughs> so it's been, been it's all life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, What's really nice is that there have been a lot of attorneys that have come to us where they're like, we had to downsize our firm. We had to let a few attorneys go. And they're like, we just need, we're underwater and we just need help. And like, we're able to be there to help them. And so that's really cool. And then I also love like learning pro like things that are missing in our app and our internal platform and like figuring out, oh, okay, this is something that both the law students and we actually have like law students who grew into recent graduates and we also have paralegals. So it's like, this is something that they would love to see in the app. And this is something the firms would love to see in the app. And so just being able to work with developers and like see essentially like write out the processes like in layman or lay woman's terms and like seeing their genius being able to implement it and in, in, into like the platform that's been so cool and I think building out the platform has been something that I'm, I'm so proud of because I never thought obviously I can't code myself but like just seeing it all come to life when it used to live in my head that's been something really incredible so as much as I went to law school took out a lot of loans and uh, loved the, everything that I learned and the business side of things. It's like, it's so exciting to me. And I love that. And so that's why the platform has been amazing because I've been able to take off the hat of like playing that middle person. And then also taking off the hat of actually having to do some of the assignments myself, because now it's just so much more efficient. It just runs efficient. Like my, I love efficiency. It's something that you know, my fiance is just like, he'll get mad at me if I'm rushing in, in or switching in and out of lanes. And I'm like, I'm driving efficiently. And he's like, no, you're not. But uh, That's, uh, I just love it. I, I, and I think that that's, that's been probably the most exciting part. Yeah. And just trying to like always strive for those efficiencies everywhere you can. Exactly. So yep, and, yep. Keep, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. I was just going to say, it makes things, everyone's lives easier, like the law students, the law firms and myself. So we love it. Well, I mean, really you, this is awesome because you're providing a platform and of course you're getting a lot of like fulfillment, it, like yeah. by doing this, but like for lawyers, you are helping so many attorneys, like just take a weight off their shoulders. A lot of yep. lawyers are, you know, they're so afraid to hire just because, right. you know, 
work. It's and, scary. Uh, it's you scary, right? Like yeah. you, you get so busy and you're like thinking, oh my gosh, I need help. And then mm-hmm. you have that fear of what if the work, you know, kind of dries up or whatever. Exactly. You know, when you have employees, it's like, hey, I got to, you know, I got to keep them busy. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're, you're constantly thinking like, I have this person sitting here, I'm paying them full time. And like, what are they like? Sometimes it's not even, it's no one's fault. It's just like, they're just kind of sitting there not doing much. And that was, that was something too, that I noticed, especially when I was at the firm, my second summer where the other, we had, there were like four or five different interns and like, sometimes it were just, we would just sit there. All the other people would sit there and not be doing anything. And that's why I was like, I'm so grateful to have this other work. Cause I get, I do get bored easily. Like I can't just sit there at my computer and like stare at the screen or browse I just like it kills me you know I want to be productive during the day and everything and um so yeah it's just a great way and like for law firms some months it's super crazy and hectic for them so they need us so much other times it's like they love that flexibility where it's like okay if I don't have that much work I'll only send one or two so again that's something that we offer and I'm so happy to be able to offer but um yeah you hit the nail on the head there yeah and you're giving um a lot of law students sort of that opportunity to kind of dig into several different areas of the law, which has to be just so just incredibly, I don't know, it's like just a great experience because a lot of times straight out of law school, you go to where you might go to where the job is. Exactly. Right? Like you might end up in litigation or you don't really know it's kind of like, where is the work? Right. And that's, yep. but when you, but this is really kind of offering um, students a chance to really dig into different areas. So yep. are, are law students vetted um, by you all before they could actually participate? Yeah, absolutely. So we have to, it's a somewhat rigorous of a vetting process. So basically they first have to submit their materials through an application form. So we have to see they have a minimum GPA, relevant work experience. We don't take any 1Ls on just because it's 1L and you should definitely focus on on schoolwork. But, um, and so once they submit the materials, if they meet our standards, then we jump on on like an informal phone interview. And the main thing that we're looking for is just like an interest in learning and being eager to be like, hey, like, I think I have an interest in IP or I think I have an interest in in bankruptcy. And like, I don't know, like, I just want to get more experience. Like, I love hearing people who kind of have that mindset of constantly wanting to grow and learn. And so, yeah, and it's just making sure that they have that interest. Like, we've actually had some students being like, oh, you know, just want me to put something on my resume. And like, that's not a, that's not a good answer. So we're not going to move forward. Um, we really want to see that, that, they understand the purpose of it. And so then once they finish that, we send them a test assignment. And the test assignment isn't actually an assignment that they complete and we submit to a firm. Like, I, I think that's, that's not right because it's like, I don't wanna make money off of something that we're testing them on. So what it is, is we give them like um, a prompt similar to something that we've had before. So it's like draft this type of agreement. Here's what you, what you need. And then they, or like, here's a research question that we typically get. And then we tell them, tell us your thought process on how you would approach this and then how you would actually complete it. And like, we just want to see the effort and we want to see that you really think about it. You don't just send us like three or four sentences, like, oh, find template input information. You know, we want to see that you're going to actually take the time, like double check all of the, uh, the section references, things like that. And I recognize that a lot of those things you don't like drafting an agreement. You don't learn that until you actually do it. So if like, they don't include specific things like that, that's fine. It's just like put in the effort. And once we see that, then we bring them onto the platform and we do have a very strict rule where it's like, if you mess up once, like, and it's not, it's not like, um, it's like really showing that you didn't care. Like you just, one time we had a client reach out who was a litigator and he's like, I need case law to support this argument. And the student literally just submitted case names, like no supporting, no background information, no analysis or anything. And it's a one and done rule. So something like that, it's like, you are off the platform. I have to remove you. You can't accept any more assignments, but that's only happened a few times. So most of the students on board, like all of them actually right now, and all of the 
students who have graduated and now are licensed attorneys and remained with us, they, um, they're all incredible. Like I take my hat off to all of them because they're the reason why the platform functions the way it does, because without them, it, no one will come and use it. Like it's really, I can trust them and they're so awesome. So excited, so receptive to feedback too, which is so crucial to me because you know, it's hard. It's hard getting feedback sometimes, but you have, like you need it in order yeah. to learn. So that's important for us too. Oh, the feedback is crucial. I mean, yeah. I'm sure at some point you will have a, a student participant who will actually use your services if you yep. have not already, right? As a lawyer. So that, yep. that will be, I'm sure a very rewarding. That's the, yeah, that's the dream. It's funny because yeah. when I first started in 2020, I brought someone on who was a third year. It was in like September, 2020. And he graduated, then he passed the bar and then he stayed on with us as a licensed attorney. And now he literally emailed me two weeks ago being like, I think I'm going to start my own firm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, congratulations. That is so awesome. Like, and I was like, if you need help, if you need assistance, just let us know. So it was, a, it was a cool, it was a cool cycle to see. Let's take a quick pause for a message from my sponsor, Prominent Practice. Are you thinking about a career transition from big law or partnership to a solo practice, selling your practice, or maybe you're launching a project unrelated to law? Whatever the reason for your transition, you'll need support along the way. Enter Prominent Practice, an executive consulting and marketing firm specializing in branding, positioning, and reputation management for transitioning attorneys. Founded by a female entrepreneur who spent a decade building smart digital platforms for thought leaders before pivoting to focus on high-end service providers who were preparing for successions, mergers, and acquisition events in their businesses. If you're thinking about making a big business move, don't risk losing the ability to leverage the reputation you've spent your career building. Let Prominent Practice be your guide. Visit prominentpractice.com slash bliss for an exclusive introduction. So, okay, I have to know, like, so you started your business, your LLC, officially June of 2020. I'm curious, like, when did... When did like the initial spark for this start? Like, obviously, like you had all the, this experience, mm -hmm. like, I want to know like how long it took you from that spark to business. Cause I'm thinking it's pretty fast. And so it was, you know, it was interesting because it happened while I was in law school. So like, it was such a time of uncertainty for me. And it was the most stressful, probably darkest time of my life, because like, I, I was just so unclear of what to do. And like, so the spark started with that first client in March, 2019. And then over that summer, that's when I was like, wow, this could really, so summer 2019, I was like, this could be a business. But there was like, I didn't have the confidence. I was like, I could actually do it. So I just, that whole first semester of my third year, I really just didn't know, should I go back to that firm or should I just risk it all and go for it? And then I thought it like in January, 20, January, 2020 actually was when right, right before the pandemic was when I like fully committed to the idea. I started telling, I told my parents, I, I was just, they were not happy, but I was just so nervous, but um I was just like, you know, I got to do it. And like third year of law school is not as crazy, especially when we were like, my commute was always like a 30 minute, I would walk to school, I'd walk through Central Park, which was nice. But, um, you know, it's an hour each day. And it was just a lot. So when I didn't have to do that because of the pandemic, and like, us, of course, we weren't socializing. And because no one was in person, it was kind of the perfect runway to launch a virtual service. So I was just like, I'm going to hit the ground running. And so I really hit the ground running in January of 2020. And then but when then I was dealing with finals and everything like that. And so then when I graduated in May, that's when I was like, let's really like roll up our sleeves and go. And it was definitely hard. It was so stressful because like, it was just stressful, so stressful, not knowing if you're going to succeed, you know, and like, it was just that fear in the back of your mind. But you know, in my gut, I was like, this is the right move. This is where I have to go. And I've read in so many books, like entrepreneurship's books, so like uh, personal growth books, it's like, trust your gut, you like your gut, your intuition knows more than you knows more than your brain knows. And so 
in my gut and like also every time I worked in any sort of corporate or firm environment I I got physically sick for some reason like one year I had this horrible rash this other year I got this horrible like flu it was just like I think those are signs that I just need to go out and just try you know you never know if you don't try and also I I was lucky because I didn't have any I had student loan debt that was it like I didn't have any kids I wasn't married and like you know all I had was my dog to care about and I was like I can do it I can risk it now and like if it doesn't work I can pivot but I might as well try so that was like the arch (laughs) no that's that's fantastic and it's interesting that you kind of initially you mentioned that you initially really just didn't didn't think that you had the self-confidence to do it yeah but then there was this transition over Mm -hmm. what like six or seven months that you're like i I can do it that's really cool and i love that you follow your gut i think that's so important i think that women are really good at following their intuition and I've, i've said before that my brain has messed up, has sent me in the wrong direction many times, but yep. my gut has not. So hundred percent, you have that feeling. It's like, everyone knows the feeling that you're talking about. It's just a matter of whether or not you're listening. And I do agree like women, that intuition is there. It's just, you got to go for it. And I, I tell my, I like anytime one of my friends comes to me and they're like, I don't know what to do. And I, I just say, I'm like, you know what to do. It's just like, you know, just ignore the rational part of your brain and just go for it because you can always, you can always adapt. You can always reset. That's like the beauty of it. But um, yeah, it's hard. It's easier said than done. It is easier said than done, especially when you have external voices, right? And a lot of of voices coming at you saying, oh, you should do this or, oh, you went to, you know, Fordham and now you're going to do this, right? Like, no, you're going to go to big law. Like, That's the other thing. You have all of these external, even your, your own crazy, you know, voices in your head, but um, just from society about how you should be or um, proceed after law school. And I also think like the long, the, the more you lean into trusting your, your gut and listening, the more it arises, right? Like hundred percent. So, okay. So I have to ask if you Like looking back over the last two years, what do you, what would you tell yourself right out of law school? Like, what have you learned? Like, what's that that big thing that you're like, oh, I wish I would have known this. Um, It's funny. I was actually just talking about this with someone, but I think I would have just told myself, like, do exactly what you think you need to do, which is like put in the hours, work the 70, 80 hours, weeks, like do it, like put in the hard work because the hard work is going to pay off, but just trust yourself. And like, you know, I think a hard thing was I, the only way of in business and personal life you grow and you learn is by having failures and mess ups. And like growing up, I was always a perfectionist where it's just like anything less than a hundred on an exam or even like a 97, I was okay with that. But if it was like a 95, I'd be upset. You know, it's just like, you have to be okay with failing and messing up and like just having things go wrong because that's how you learn and that's how you grow and that's how you adapt and like I think by having those it just makes you so much stronger for when the next challenge arises so I think I would have told myself like you're gonna face a lot of challenges uh, but just go at it with like an open mindset and like view it as like something that a growing lesson and I think that was key because I was so hard on myself you know crying when just things would go wrong and I'd be like oh, I just didn't know what to do. And like now when I have a challenge, I'm like, all right, come at me. Like, how are we going to solve this? Yeah. So it's, it's been, so it's a mental, it's a a lot of life. I think is just so mental, you know, and it's just like forge forward, do what you want to do. And like, just believe in yourself. And I think that's key too. Like anyone can do, like, we're all human beings, you know, like, even if you're not a brilliant genius, like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, you know, you can, you can still, you can achieve what you set out to achieve just by like setting goals for yourself and like actually creating actionable steps to get there. And like, that's what I wish there's so, you know, I wish I knew it then, but the only way I'd know it then is if, um, you know, by going through what I've gone through in the last two years. So it's been a lot of growing, a lot of learning. Do you think that you've learned more in the last two years running your own business? 
Oh we're yeah. Three years of law school. You knew exactly oh my gosh. That. <laughs> yeah. Not even like a, not even a question. The theoretical classes of law school are really interesting. And like reading the opinions of these uh, Supreme Court judges, Fordham also had the opportunity where like we were able to listen to Supreme Court judges that came in and spoke to us. Like it's so cool, but and it's like it's almost like uh, watching a cool documentary or something, but actually going through life and like learning by doing. Oh, my God, I've learned so much more. I think I've learned so much more in the last two years than I have in the prior 25 years of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Business ownership will do that. <laughs> so you mentioned, you mentioned that you're a perfectionist. Have you noticed or did you notice when you kind of started this journey that you were seeking perfection and that it was preventing you from actually like completing (laughs) a million percent? Like everything you're saying is so accurate by being a perfectionist, you're not going to scale, you know, like you have to be okay with you not doing the every single wearing every single hat doing every single test like you have to be okay with trusting someone else to do it and even if they do it 80 percent as well as you do it that's still okay because that's the only way you're going to be able to actually expand and grow the business and that was a really hard lesson like delegation 101 is like being able to actually delegate. And I wasn't able to do it for the longest time. And it's funny because the whole business is like law students doing the work and I couldn't, yeah, it was like for the first year, there was like, there was a lot of monetary growth from like a few clients who were just sending so much, but I was doing so much of it. And then when I realized, okay, if I need to grow, I can, I'm at my capacity right now. So if I want to grow more, I actually need to put in processes, have people on board to allow me to grow more. And so that, and once I started actually delegating, we were able to grow 2X, you know, and like, I'm hoping to grow even further by delegating more, but that's literally the only way to grow. And like, it's, it's, a, it's a hard pill to swallow as a perfectionist, but it's a lot easier now that I see it work, you know? You should do, like, if you're doing any business development or, like, educational seminars or whatever, um, prospective client outreach, you should do sort of, like, a 15, 20-minute, like, talk or something on, like, overcoming, like, how I overcame, you know, my perfectionism just to, just to or, or, like, and learn to delegate because, that is a big problem. I think that's a big concern that a lot of people have, right? Is kind of really like letting, letting that element go and kind of trusting the universe that it's going to be, it's going to work out. So, um, okay. So I have to know what is next for you and gig law? Yeah, that's the goal. That is truly the goal. No, it's been super exciting. And so we're adding more features to the app to make it even more scalable. I'm looking to bring on at least 20 more students to be able to keep up with the capacity. So we have a long wait list. And so we're going through that wait list right now to bring people on board. But if you know anyone, just send them our way. And then we're actually hoping to expand into Latin America and Spain by translating the app into into Spanish and partnering with this awesome law firm who um, they have offices all over. So that's going to be a hopefully a really nice uh, next uh, big expansion for us. And just, you know, just keep growing, keep learning and like keep learning what we can do to be better. And so that's the goal. That's like the short term vision and just continuing. And like the estate planning, I hope to bring on more students who are interested in estate planning because, you know, I don't think it's as popular as uh you know it should be it's not super sexy right I mean yeah but I think it's really cool I really think it's an awesome field but we also have some incredible paralegals on board like and when I say incredible like they are they have saved me at least like 30 hours a week now just by having them on board which is so awesome but uh yeah just continuing to expand each branch of the business and but being able to do it in like um not so quickly where we make, where we have to sacrifice the quality. So it's always maintaining that quality, but uh, that's the, that's the next, the, the next goals for gig law. We'll, we'll see where we go. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for you. I have no doubt that it's going to happen. 
I have a feeling Knock on wood. <laughs> you are obviously like most people that you set your mind to it. It's, it's I appreciate happen, that. So I'm excited. What's up? Yeah. No, it's a, it's an exciting time. Thank you so much. No, I appreciate it. I, again, like one of the best parts of it is being able to connect and meet people like you. Cause it's just, it's awesome. It really yeah. is. And you get to talk about your business, right? It's so much fun. Yeah. And, and I have loved doing podcasts because I've, met, you know, it, it's funny what you said a minute ago about some attorney, you know, there's attorneys that kind of have, you know, certain reputation, like the women that I've met doing this have all been, I mean, unbelievable. Like I want to say that word, I'm not going to there, but just unbelievable, inspiring, intelligent, um, you know, giving women and exactly like, I just, every single time that I do a call like this, like, I just am so inspired and optimistic yeah and i love that there are women like you all that are out there just killing it and can inspire you too. <laughs> can inspire young lady you know young women yes. that are you know even if they're not even like committed to go to going to law school right? right just 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 to show them that you can go to law school and do so many different things or exactly you get out of law school and you're like yeah, i don't know if i want to go to big law <laughs> right like you exactly there's you know you have a world of opportunities don't be afraid uh, exactly. and and follow your gut so oh yeah. where can people find you on linkedin is the main place to find me i'm also on twitter uh, LinkedIn, it's just my name. So uh, Haley Lavishvili. And then also you can go to the gig law page on LinkedIn. We do have an Instagram page, though I will admit uh, it is not as active as it likely should be. But I do find that more the most people we connect with is through LinkedIn or Twitter. Twitter is a great place to find us. So mainly LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, if you ever want to shoot me an email or schedule time on my Calendly, it's just calendly.com slash gig law. And I love chatting with anyone and everyone. So <laughs> that is an awesome, anyway. that's awesome. Calendly.com um, backslash gig law. That's perfect. Thank you so much again for having me. This has been such a pleasure. This was so much fun. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. <laughs> Bye, my friend. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today on Legally Bliss Conversations. If you love this episode and you want to hang out with other inspiring and light gold female attorneys, be sure to join the Legally Bliss community at legallybliss.com. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at Susie Hickson. See you next time.